So I've seen a few different channels doing this good to evil thing, and I really wanted to do a Venture Brothers one because the characters are, for the most part, very morally ambiguous. Actually ordering them good to evil was so difficult. So Venture Brothers is a show where there is a so-called good and evil side, mainly the OSI uh, on the good side and the guild on the bad side. There's other minor factions, but this is a world where people can sign up for their own costumed aggressor to go back and forth with. So just because someone is a good guy doesn't necessarily speak to their morality. Coming in at most good, he isn't even human. He's the Ventures robot helper. This humanoid electronic lab partner robot was created by Jonas Venture to help with pretty much anything you might need. Helper has a full arsenal of weapons, but this helper was mainly used as Rusty's nanny growing up. Because of this, the little blue robot has a very strong attachment to Rusty to this day. Despite being a robot, it's clear he loves his family and would do anything for them. Not that he succeeds all that often. Helper is an all-loving, all-caring being, even capable of disobeying direct commands if it means hurting his family. He's also significant in that he is one of the only figures in Rusty's childhood that loved him unconditionally, and despite what Dr. Venture might say, he clearly has a bond with Helper. It's okay, Helper. She's gone now. And while we're at it, might as well throw Helper 2 on the list. He essentially has the same personality as Helper, except maybe a little more neurotic. Maybe. The main difference being that he can actually speak English because he was modified with human parts. Like Helper, he's shown to be loving and caring without a mean robot bone in his body. And just to round out the all-loving non-humans, I'm gonna give Scamp 3 a mention here too. He was one of Rusty's pet dogs growing up. We see him trying to protect Rusty despite being a little tiny lap dog. Next is Sally Impossible's cousin, Ned. Turned into a human callus by one of Richard Impossible's experiments gone wrong. Ned was kept locked away along with the rest of Sally's family by Richard until she met Jonas Jr. and they began a new life on Spider Skull Island. Ned has the mentality of a small child and the innocence of one too. He's shown to be very protective of his family, especially his cousin Cody. He sometimes doesn't know his own strength, like when he hugs Jonas Jr., but this is hardly his fault. Douglas Ong. Dr. Dugon, aka Dr. Douglas Ong, a super scientist and the brother of Wide Whale. Just an all-around nice guy. Dugon loved sea creatures and wanted humanity to learn their peaceful ways. He tried to stop his brother from conducting the experiment that ultimately mutated both of them, and stopped him from killing the monarch. What more do you want? Jonas Venture Jr., Rusty's twin brother who he swallowed in the womb. Imagine that, being born at like age 40. Anyway, Rusty finds JJ insufferable because of how successful he is, but the truth is Jonas Jr. wants what's best for the world. Despite the unusual circumstances of his birth, JJ warmed up to his family very quickly. He clearly loves his nephews, and even though he can find Rusty quite infuriating, he still clearly wants what's best for him. He was a bit of a womanizer early on, but that stopped when he met his wife, Sally Impossible. He also adopted her cousin Ned and treats him like he were his own child. He sacrificed himself to save everyone on board Gargantua too. In his will, he left Spider Skull Island to Sally and her family and his New York headquarters and company to his brother and his family, making sure they were all equally comfortable for the remainder of their lives. He also took in Hector and Swifty after Rusty heartlessly threw them out. Now, of course, in his first appearance, he did try and outright murder Rusty. But I mean, I don't know, how would you react if you spent 43 years as a fully conscious human being living inside someone else? I think rather than subtract points for that one, we should be impressed he got over it as quickly as he did. Some people might also point to the fact that JJ fully buys into the lie of his father's greatness, but I don't think that's fair to hold against him. Jonas Sr. had amazing PR his whole life. And besides that, like, that's the guy's dad who he never knew. I think it's perfectly natural that he would idolize him and put him on a pedestal. He wants his father to be the great man that he's always said to be. And that idolization of Jonas Sr. is what motivated JJ's entire scientific career. Jonas Jr. was a kind man who gave a lot to the world during his short life. More than making up for that little attempted fratricide incident. Jefferson Twilight. 
Top tier Blackula hunter and member of the Order of the Triad, Jefferson Twilight has done nothing wrong in his life ever, and I know this and I love him. He took up Blackula hunting after he saw his mother killed by Blackulas as a child. Despite his dry sarcasm, he also exhibits childlike excitement, especially when he's discovered he did have a magic power, being a bridge between worlds. Jefferson is total cool dad friend energy, and we love him for that. Ghost Robot, a ghost who lives in the head of a robot. First introduced as a member of Captain Sunshine's superhero team, secret alias Weatherbot 5, we later see him going undercover for the OSI to get intel on the Council of Thirteen. Despite seemingly not having emotions himself, he offers Captain Sunshine emotional support. Ghost Robot Man, what a guy. Hank Venture. Hank, one of the titular Venture Brothers, he's a good-natured, enthusiastic teenage boy, naive in many ways, yet surprisingly capable. He is also brave, being shown numerous times he's willing to risk his life to save others, even, or perhaps especially, when the odds are stacked against him. Hank can be a bit of a bully to his twin brother Dean, especially in the earlier seasons, but it never goes beyond typical sibling rivalry. One of Hank's most notable traits is how personable he is. He gets along extremely well with others, and is able to instantly befriend people like Dermot, the Alchemist, the Monarch 21, the Action Man, and many others. While dating Serena, it was clear he loved her very much and valued the time they spent together, even risking his life to be with her. During a blizzard, when she wouldn't return his calls, he was totally consumed with the worry that something happened to her. Hank most definitely has the purest heart of the main Venture crew. Triana Orpheus, daughter of Dr. Orpheus and Dean Venture's first crush. Triana is a sweet girl who was close friends with the Venture Boys for a majority of her time in the series. Like, yes, she does lie to her dad about drinking, but that's very typical and it's not like she drinks to the point of it interfering with her life or anything. She can get kind of annoyed with the boys' immature escapades sometimes, like Hank Co or Dean staging Lady Windermere's fan, but she obviously cares about them a lot, seeing as she was so affected by their temporary deaths. Her last appearance was in Operation Prom, when her and Dean had a nasty falling out. To be clear, Dean was totally the one in the wrong there, but at the same time, you know, you went to prom as just friends with a kid you know has a huge crush on you, right after introducing him to your new boyfriend. You, you had to have seen this coming. Amber Gold an OSI agent and colleague of Brock. She is portrayed as kind and bubbly, but insecure. It's implied this is because her boyfriend, Headshot, is abusive towards her. Because of this, she has an affair with Brock. Side note, anyone else ship Amber and Brock way more than Warriana and Brock? Anyway. In all this in Gargantua 2, she takes an interest in Brock's family and is very pleased to meet Hank. Amber is obviously emotionally moved by how much Brock cares for the Venture Boys. She's a very enthusiastic agent, believing wholly in her duty to protect citizens and take down the Guild's Council of Thirteen. Kimberly McManus Kimberly is an OSI sniper who fell in love with a member of the Guild, Stranger S-464. Despite her loyalty to the OSI, she was willing to risk that to be with the one she loved, mainly because the Guild is evil, but still have a code of honor. That is, until she discovers he is secretly a mole for the Peril Partnership. Not the villain organization from Canada, but an unauthorized offshoot started by the ruthless The Creep. Even after all of that though, she still has feelings for 464, and is impressed when he becomes a double, double agent. The romance ends tragically though, as 464 ends up being memory wiped by the guild with no memory of their relationship. Action Johnny, a former boy adventurer and childhood friend of Rusty. He is a drug addict whose development was completely crippled by his traumatic and abusive childhood, having accomplished nothing his entire adult life. While he obviously turned out a lot less successful and functional than Rusty, he also turned out to be a lot better of a person. His addiction doesn't really affect anyone but himself. Johnny is also a lot more aware of just how much boy adventuring screwed him up. Whereas Rusty still pines for his glory days as a child star, Johnny wouldn't wish that life on anyone, never having had any kids of his own to repeat the cycle with. He even offers to take Dean away from it all, telling him he doesn't have to live like this. His talk at Rusty's boy adventurer day camp consisted him of telling the kids that his dad didn't love or care for him and that he had loved his precious serum more than he loved him. 
Johnny thinks the former boy adventurers should stick together since they have no one else. Now, Johnny's addiction did take a toll on his brother, but Johnny did go to therapy and later rehab, and last we saw him, he's clean. He even offered to let Dr. Z chase him around a little for his final arch when earlier in the series, the mere sight of Dr. Z made him break down completely. So yeah, he may be a complete mess for the majority of the series, but Action Johnny says no to continuing that cycle of boy adventurer abuse, and for that, we commend him. Brown Widow, aka Jared. A New York superhero introduced in season 4. In season 6, he becomes Dean's roommate at university. As a superhero, Brown Widow is heroic and confident. He tends to be successful at saving people, which is a lot more than can be said for some of the other heroes on this show. As an everyday person, Jared is kind of insecure and a bit of an oddball, but generally nice. Of course, in Rusty's opinion, he takes near-death incidents a little too lightly. What? This is funny to you? I just almost got killed. But then again, he does have perfect spider pitch. Dean Venture, the other Venture twin. Remember when Dean used to call himself Deany V? Anyway, like his brother, Dean is a very sheltered and naive young man for the first part of the series. The revelation that he's a clone of himself caused him to withdraw into himself during season 5, but this was also an opportunity for him to mature significantly. Dean is a very loving person for the most part, especially his family, and like any twin, he has a special bond with his brother. He even had an honest and thoughtful conversation with 24, wanting to help him work out his many issues. He's also very emotional, however, something that caused him to have this big blowout with Triana Orpheus at the homeschool prom, which ended their friendship. But Dean is still a good-natured kid who never goes out of his way to hurt anyone. He would have probably been placed next to Hank if it wasn't for one thing. In season 7, he slept with Hank's girlfriend, Serena Ong. Oof. I'm still keeping Dean pretty high on the good list though, because we see how remorseful he is of this in the next episode. It was a mistake, and being a good person is about learning from one's mistakes, not never ever making them. So even with that mark to his reputation, Dean is still one of the most moral people on the show. <sighs> Dr. Tara Quim childhood friend of Rusty's and his possible half-sister. She is a much more competent adventurer and doctor than Rusty, seeing as she has an actual doctorate and all. She also has much more noble intentions, trying to cure cancer, protect the rainforest, forwarding poachers, etc. You really gotta give her credit for how well she turned out as an adult, having Colonel Gentleman of all people as a stepfather, and apparently having been put through shock therapy at some point in her life. She does seem maybe a little stuck up. She told her bodyguard Ginny, you forget your place, but this was also during an extremely tense argument, so you know, <laughs> I'll let it slide. Dermot Fichtel, Hank's best friend and super secret third venture brother. Dermot has a very douchey, braggadocious personality. He likes talking back to adults and has a habit of lying to make himself seem cool. So much so that he can't even keep track of all those lies. But underneath all of that, Dermot is actually a pretty sweet kid. Like, sure, he talks tough, but it's not like he actually picks fights with people. Not that he could. He's just a lonely kid who wants a friend. He's never actually gone out of his way to be cruel or anything. In fact, he's given the Venture Boys good advice on more than one occasion. And bad advice on more than one occasion. But you know, that's ignorance, not malice. He really just wants to play pretend with his buddy Hank. He wasn't even upset when he found out Dr. Venture was his real father and wasn't around his entire life. More just stoked to be a Venture. After the Venture compound burned down, Dermot joined OSI, which he actually seems to be doing pretty well at. Catclops, Manic 8-Ball, and Girl Hitler. Former advisors to Baron Underbite, they later led a rebellion against him and overthrew Underland's government. Girl Hitler becoming the new president and leading the country into a progressive and peaceful new future. Now, they do seem pretty ruthless when we first meet them, but seeing as they are immediately revealed to be traitors and seeing as how pathetic their rebellion was before the Ventures showed up, it's safe to assume this was all talk. We see girl Hitler at the UN in a later episode, so we can assume they're all doing pretty good. Kano, formerly the sidekick to the Blue Morpho, he eventually became the original Team Ventures bodyguard. Kano was a difficult one to place. On the one hand, he's definitely the nicest of the original Team Venture, but on the other hand, 
He did nothing about the constant abuse inflicted on Rusty by his teammates. But on the other other hand, you could easily argue he wasn't really in a position to do so. When we are first introduced to this character, we are told that he has taken a vow of silence because he took from the world a great man. We're led to believe several times this was Jonas Sr., but it's later revealed it was Don Fitzcarraldo, aka the Blue Morpho. This revelation is very significant to the content of his character. Killing Jonas would have certainly warranted feeling guilty enough to take that vow, but under these circumstances, it brings a whole new level to this character. His killing was not only totally justified since he was strangling Rusty, but what he killed was in fact a hideous abomination back from the dead subservient cyborg version of Dawn. And to still feel that much guilt, he obviously has a big heart. Margaret Fichtel, the mother of Nikki Fichtel and grandmother of Dermot Fichtel. Ooh, yeah, spoilers for something that was revealed like 10 years ago. When Nikki got pregnant with Dermot by Dr. Venture, Margaret was understandably more than a little upset. She made sure Rusty never saw her daughter or the baby and also forced him to pay Nikki a large amount of under the table child support. She was obviously extremely protective of her daughter Nikki, raising Dermot as her own because Nikki was still in school. She's also shown that she loves Dermot a lot, and when he was older, she even gave him a clue about who his real father was, taking him to the Venture compound during Rusty's day camp. I mean, that's honestly pretty big of her, despite how much she hates the guy, to still recognize it would be unfair for Dermot to not to know who his dad is. Dr. Orpheus. He's a necromancer and leader of the Order of the Triad who rented a room in the Venture compound until it burned down. Orpheus is an all-around good guy. He's always portrayed as a good and loving father to his daughter Triana, even if he can be a little too trusting of her at times. He also cares for the Venture family a great deal, especially Hank and Dean. But even Dr. Venture, who is usually a total jerk to him. Now, Orpheus did slap the monarch and set his shoes on fire with no provocation because he was hoping to get an arch enemy. So yeah, he messed with a lot of the villains at the yard sale for that reason. He also told the other triad members that he wouldn't bring them to see the master because Al is gay. Bruh, not cool. Of course, Orpheus may have been more worried about the master's prejudice as he himself isn't shown to be homophobic any other time. Orpheus is the kind of guy who would drop anything to help someone in need, no matter the risk. He is friendly, unbelievably forgiving, and incredibly loyal. Billy Quizboy Billy is a former boy genius and quiz show contestant, current neurogeneticist, and co-owner of Conjectual Technologies. He is almost always seen with his best friend and business partner Pete White. Billy has a tendency to get himself roped into performing surgery, whether it's helping out the Venture family or being kidnapped in a burlap sack and forced to. Either way, he takes his job very seriously. He refused to let his patient Monstroso die, even when asked to by Sphinx. He also went out of his way to try and make Dean feel as comfortable as possible when he performed surgery for his testicular torsion. Billy is loyal, has a strong moral compass, and is full of enthusiasm. He hated when White and later Brock and Hunter cheated on his behalf. He idolized Rusty Venture as a child and has gone out of his way multiple times to remind Rusty how amazing he was as a kid. He also has too big of a heart to tell his mom he and White aren't a couple since she's so supportive and happy for them. Hunter Gathers Hunter is an OSI agent who originally trained Brock Sampson. Hunter may come off as a little off the rails, but in the end does everything for the greater good. Hunter saw right through the Pyramid War BS, focusing her efforts instead on taking down the guild. Hunter is also insistent on the rule to never kill a woman or a child, believing this to be what separates them from the bad guys. It's not clear if this is OSI's rule or her personal rule, but either way, she always enforces this and drilled it into Brock while training him. Years later, Hunter went rogue. The exact reasons aren't clear, but knowing Hunter, it was probably some kind of moral issue. She then infiltrated the Blackhearts and took them down as well. This is because they have no loyalty or rules and are therefore extremely dangerous. The same reason she started the new Sphinx as a way of taking down villains who refused to play by the rules. Hunter eventually became the leader of OSI, purging the organization of double agents and eventually teaming up with the guild to stop the Blue Morpho from wantonly murdering guild villains. 
Hunter's main concern is always the safety and well-being of everyday people, making sure that costumed adventurers and villains follow the rules and prevent chaos. In order to do this, though, Hunter kills a lot of people. Her intentions are always pure, and these people are always a danger to society, but many of these people could probably have been apprehended instead. Sally Impossible, the ex-wife of Professor Richard Impossible and widow to Jonas Venture Jr. Her first husband is responsible for her mutation. Her skin turns invisible unless she concentrates hard enough. Because of this, Richard kept her isolated from the outside world. She was confined to her room in the ice station, and at one impossible plaza, Richard didn't even want her to go to the store. This left her very timid and meek, but she gained a lot of confidence once she left him for JJ. Sally is a very loving mother to her son, Rocket. Richard's indifference towards the baby being one of the reasons she left him. She also loves her cousins, JJ, and is even shown to care for the pirate captain. Sally did tell Dr. Venture that Ned was used to being ostracized because he was a quote, but Sally treats Ned very well, as I've mentioned, so to me, this sounds like her being influenced by Richard as he barely even sees Ned as a human. And seeing as she got with Richard when she was a freshman in college and he was her professor, it's safe to say that he had a lot of influence over her life for a very long time. Despite all of that though, she still saved his life, even after he became a villain, because she doesn't want her son to grow up without a father. Mrs. Fitzcarraldo, the monarch's mother and Don Fitzcarraldo's wife. We don't know a ton about her other than the fact that she was a New York socialite. In the few glimpses we do see of her, she is shown to be a devoted, loving mother and very much in love with her husband. She did, however, cheat on her husband with Jonas Venture Sr., him being the real father of her only son. But Jonas was a master manipulator and clearly preyed on the couple's desperation to have a child, telling Dawn he would give his wife fertility treatment. So to me, Mrs. Fitzcarraldo is a victim in this situation. Desmond. Desmond was the original Captain Sunshine and serves as the current Captain Sunshine's butler. Not only was he a superhero in his day, but he spent his entire life advocating for the rights of sidekicks and henchmen. Zero was later able to trick him into kidnapping a bunch of them by telling him they were throwing them a party for all their hard work. He bravely threw himself at Zero, even though he was a weak, injured old man. He wasn't effective, but still. He doesn't do anything to stop Captain Sunshine's ongoing lawsuit against an ex-Wonder Boy, but considering how easily Zero tricked him, he probably doesn't know what's going on. Pete White, a college friend of Rusty's and the other half of Conjectual Technologies. Pete White may be lazy, unmotivated, childish, bitchy, snide, and fickle, but he's also royal as hell. He really does love his friends, and at the end of the day would do anything for them, especially Billy and Rusty. When White first met Billy, he was the host of the Quiz Boys game show. Billy was a contestant on. He cheated for Billy, which resulted in a scandal and Billy not getting any of his winnings, but the reason he did this is because he saw a kinship in Billy, him being uh, hydrocephalic, and White's albinoism caused them to be alienated, and he wanted Billy to win the money so that he could go to MIT. After that didn't work, he tried to get Billy a job with Rusty and later took him around to the underground quiz boy circuit to earn money that way. Now it's true, he did accidentally enter Billy into a dogfight, causing him to lose his hand and eye, but he didn't know that. This caused Billy to leave him, sending White into a deep depression. When Brock showed up later with a memory wiped Billy, White hugs him, clearly relieved he's alright. Yes, it's true, he did agree to keep Billy's past from him and knocked him out when he regained the memories so he could be memory wiped again, but it's pretty obvious he had to agree to do this in order to get Billy at all. And if he didn't, who knows where the kid would have ended up. He also paid Sphinx $50,000 to save Billy when he was kidnapped by Monstroso and has shown a willingness to throw himself into danger to save others multiple times. General Timothy Trister is the former head of the OSI. He is erratic, volatile, and a little bit nutty, but much like Hunter, his crazy ideas are often proven true, although not always. Trister is dedicated to the OSI and values each of his agents as if they were his own family, even the members of New Sphinx while they were rogue, revealing Skypilot has been secretly working for him the entire time. 
He put Hunter in charge of the OSI after shooting himself into space because he knew Hunter was a good and capable person. He ended up surviving and his final act was sacrificing himself to save everyone on board Gargantua 2 along with Jonas Jr. Bud Manstrong Bud Manstrong was one of the two astronauts manning Gargantua 1. He is a straight-laced, sexually repressed, traditional type of man. He was in love with his co-worker and girlfriend, Lieutenant Anna Baldovich, but was too afraid to go all the way with her. When the Ventures come to help fix the space station, she sleeps with Brock, and Manstrong becomes extremely jealous. It looks like he's gonna try and kill Brock, but instead he tells him he should marry Anna. In his next appearance, he is hailed as a hero after Gargantua 1 crashes to Earth. The president wants him to run as his VP in the next election, but Manstrong turns him down, being disgusted with the man's conduct. The ghost of Abraham Lincoln, yeah, <laughs> thinks he's going to assassinate the president, but the chip he thought was controlling Manstrong was just the space station's black box that became lodged in his neck during the crash. The Pirate Captain Lost at sea for 10 years, the pirate captain and his crew survived by raiding cargo ships pretending to be ghost pirates. When they attempted this scam on the Ventures, it ends pretty badly for them. But the remaining pirates, including the captain, do get a ride back to America on the X-2. When the boat was given to JJ, it was discovered that the pirate captain was still living on it, and he eventually started working for Jonas Jr. He was obviously very grateful to the chairman, as he called him, even if he could get quite fed up with his demands, mainly during the Jonas Venture Senior Museum's opening night. Now. There was the time he went off on Sally, totally unprovoked, but he was all hopped up on tranquilizer darts at the time, so... For the most part, the pirate captain is a chill dude just doing his job, whether that's for JJ or later Dr. Venture himself. Now we get to the gray area. These characters are not exactly good, but they aren't evil either, falling somewhere in between. Starting with the closest to good, of course, and then descending. The Alchemist, the third and final member of the Order of the Triad. The Alchemist, or Al for short, spent a large portion of his life searching for the cure for AIDS. He's extremely personable, friendly, and gets along great with kids, letting Triana dye his hair, playing detective with Hank, this whole thing's got too real. But he would definitely be in the good category if it weren't for that time he intentionally baited Jefferson Twilight into going into a diabetic coma. Like, just for fun. <laughs> Bruh! Oh yeah, and he wanted to kill the Celestin that they summoned from a trading card because he was creeped out by him. Serena Ong, the daughter of Wide Whale and girlfriend of Hank Venture. She may be loud, abrasive, and generally rude, but Serena is a good-hearted person. Like the Venture Boys, she just wants a normal life, and she fell for Hank because of how kind-hearted he was and the lengths he went to impress her. The reason I put her in the grey instead of the good is because of the fact that she cheated on Hank with Dean, and unlike with Dean, we don't get the benefit of seeing the aftermath of this. For Dean, I let the same event slide because of how much it tore him up, but we don't see if Serena has the same guilt, we also don't get much motivation for this besides feeling smothered by Hank, which is pretty weak. Dr. Z, a well-respected older supervillain who used to arch Action Johnny's family. He has mostly retired, but is secretly a member of the Council of Thirteen. Yes, it's true, Dr. Z may be a villain, who apparently killed his own number two at some point, but that doesn't make him a bad guy. Dr. Z was all about the art of the arch. He loved being a supervillain, and he did it in style, damn it. In his old age, he's become a mentor to younger villains, and as a member of the Council, he enforces the Guild's strict rules. He was also horrified to see the robot he stole from Jonas Venture was part human. Yes, he's still reprogrammed it for evil, but he is a villain. He also sent the Monarch N21 to kill the Creep and wanted to kill the Blue Morpho too, but that's because these were dangerous, unsanctioned villains going around murdering people. He's the only member of his generation of villains, or heroes, who takes responsibility for how messed up the child adventurers turned out. He also tries to help Rusty, Action Johnny, and several other boy adventurers move on with their lives, and adopted Roboy. He clearly cares for Johnny a lot, telling him he loved him when he went to see him in rehab for his final arch. 
even asking Johnny to move in with him. Dr. Z may be a villain, but he's a villain with class. Brick Frog. Brick Frog is a low-level supervillain whose only skills are brick throwing and frog being. He's a member of the guild, but we never actually see him do anything evil, and he's implied to be pretty incompetent. You may be wondering why I even included him at all. Well, same reason I included Ghost Robot. I like saying his name. The Blue Morpho. The Blue Morpho, aka Don Fitzcarraldo, was a superhero and the father of the monarch. He started off as a genuine hero, but came to be seen as a dangerous vigilante. Later in the series, it was revealed that this was because Jonas Venture Sr. blackmailed him with a sex tape into doing his bidding, i.e. anything that was too shady for Teen Venture's squeaky clean image. Don loved his wife and felt horrible that he had cheated on her, this being the reason he didn't want the tape getting out. He also loved his son a lot, though was neglectful of him, at least according to the monarch. When he died, Jonas resurrected him as a cyborg called Venturion. When the memory of the plane crash that killed his wife was triggered, he nearly strangled Rusty to death, thinking he was the plane's throttle. Later, as the memory wiped and reprogrammed Vendetta, it was again the memory of this crash that allowed him to start regaining his memories and eventually revert back to his old self. Before dying a final time, he looks at his now grown son and smiles. Lance and Dale Hale, the Hale Twins, former boy detectives based partially on the Hardy Boys and partially on the Menendez brothers. So first of all, Lance is a bit of a bully. Okay, he's a total bully, mainly to Wonder Boy, who he seems to hate for like no reason. Also a little to his brother, but to be fair, he doesn't want Dale letting it slip that they killed their dad. Lance obviously does care about Dale, though, and is also shown defending him. Also, you don't team up with your brother to kill your abusive dad unless you two have a pretty strong bond. Dale is kind of just a nice dude, very guilty over what he did to his father, but make no mistake, just as responsible. Both their fingerprints were on that gun. Dale is also not above a little sniping back and forth with his fellow former boy adventurers either. And yes, you know, they did kill their dad, but let's be real, he probably deserved it. Red Mantle and Dragoon, the two oldest members of the guild. They sit on the Council of Thirteen, their true identities being Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper. When Phantom Lim was going through his little crazy phase, he kidnapped the men and forced Billy Quizboy to sew them together. We don't really know much about their time as villains other than the fact that Dragoon used to arch the original Captain Sunshine. We never hear any details about either of them doing anything particularly heinous, so we can assume much like Dr. Z, they were more about the style that went into arching. In their old age, they've retired, preferring a quieter life of watching TV and reminiscing about their past. Dragoon also appears to be going senile, forgetting a lot of details from his past, including confusing his own life with the Hanna-Barbera cartoon Wacky Races. They also continue to serve on the council after the death of the Sovereign, going after dangerous unsanctioned villains, mainly Blue Morpho 2. Scare Bear, a mysterious character. They are an unknown person in a bear suit, holding a knife and covered in blood. They auditioned for the Revenge Society and effectively freaked them completely out. Later, they saved Hank from the blizzard and brought him to Dean's dorm, presumably knowing Dean had slept with Serena. And that's about all we know. Patty and Sonny. Patty and Sonny were two members of the Groovy Gang, a group of ordinary criminals who stumble upon the Venture Compound one night. Based on both the Scooby Gang and Ted Bundy, Valerie Solanus, Patty Hearst, and David Berkowitz. Patty and Sonny are very much controlled by the group's leader, Ted, and to a lesser extent, Val. Patty was kidnapped and is kept locked in a box most of the time. Ted has been telling her they're driving to her parents' house for the past 10 years. Sonny is a paranoid schizophrenic who hears the voice of his dog, Groovy. Ted withholds his medication from him and physically abuses him. He and Groovy killed Hank and Dean at some point, but if he were allowed to take his meds and wasn't a slave to a psychopath, that most likely wouldn't have happened. Headshot. An OSI agent and the boyfriend of Amber Gold. This guy is a total douchebag. He's emotionally abusive towards his girlfriend and had a huge overreaction to finding out her long blonde hair was a wig. Also, unlike Hunter or Amber, he doesn't seem to be with OSI because 
because he genuinely believes in what they're doing, but more to show off his own skill and gain glory for himself. Henchman 24. Henchman 24. Rest in peace, bro. Rest in peace. He was one of the monarch's henchmen and 21's best friend. 24 was a true do-nothing henchman, taking any and every opportunity to slack off, lag behind, or avoid battle. He was like that kid in gym class who just stands there during dodgeball until they get hit so they can go sit on the bench. In fact, that's what got him killed. 24 had no other career opportunities, being practically forced into the life. Sure, he thinks the evil lifestyle is pretty cool, and he jumped at the opportunity to go off and be a villain with 21, but he's just kind of a regular dude. Because of this, he hasn't actually committed that many evil acts, he just wants to sit around and BS with Gary. His friendship with 21 is kind of sweet if you think about it too. Like, 24 is way older, and 21 was kidnapped at 15 and forced to become a henchman, so that means 24 probably took the new kid under his wing, maybe just feeling sorry for him at first, and they became inseparable. Nikki Fichtel, Dermot's mom, who he believes to be his older sister. She is obviously a very sympathetic character given her backstory, impregnated by Dr. Venture at 15, having a son who you can't even tell you're actually their mother. She obviously loves Dermot, sharing her fond memories of him in her Shallow Gravy interview. But the reason Nikki is in the grey is because, number one, she slept with Hank when he was underage, or believed they the timeline's kind of messed up because of the constant deaths, but anyways, it's her son's friend, so you presume she thinks they're the same age, although maybe if he was already born, then, um, okay, it's just really confusing, maybe just forget that, but the real reason is because, um, even though she was 100% the victim in the situation with Rusty, her obsession with Rusty Venture is kind of bizarre to say the least. Firstly, she outright tells Hank she's attracted to him because he reminds her of Rusty Venture, specifically the fake, marketable version of Rusty, who's a 10-year-old. And her obsession has always focused solely on that 10-year-old version of Rusty. Not teenage Rusty, child Rusty. Even at 15, that isn't really all that forgivable, but at 30, it's downright unacceptable. Now, of course, it's possible this traumatic experience stunted her mentally, but, you know, maybe keep her away from boy adventurers. Shore leave. A former OSI agent, he was kicked out on a don't ask, don't tell violation, eventually joining the new Sphinx and went back with OSI after Hunter was put in charge. Shoreleaf can be catty and a bit of a bully, but he's a good guy who wants to do what's right. With Sphinx, he worked to take out dangerous unsanctioned villains and other general threats OSI wouldn't or couldn't deal with. Shoreleaf, however, kills a lot of people and uh, really enjoys it. Still, Shoreleaf is a good guy, just the, you know, getting off on killing, it, it can really move you down on a list like this. Gary Fisher, aka Henchman21. He started out as a geeky slacker, but after 24's death, rose through the ranks, becoming the monarch's best and most feared henchman, and eventually his full-fledged number two. He was kidnapped and forced into this life, and like 24, he used to think the villain lifestyle was pretty cool, but ultimately would try and get away with doing as little as possible. 21 cared deeply for his best friend and was shaken by his death. He was even willing to raise a clone of 24 as his own son, although Dr. Venture wouldn't accept his payment of a copy of Marvel Comics No. 1. Even during his two-ton 21 period, he avoided killing. For example, simply paying off a cab driver when the monarch had ordered him killed. During season 5, 21 was constantly flip-flopping between good and evil, unsure of his place in the world. He led the other henchmen in killing Tim, Tom, and Kevin after discovering they had been the ones responsible for killing 24. When taking on the moniker of the new Kano, he and the monarch take out the villains who are ahead of them in Arch and Dr. Venture. They kill their first two targets by accident, but when the monarch orders him to kill the wandering spider, he does, albeit reluctantly. This act caused him a crippling amount of guilt, having nightmares about it. This causes him to put his foot down, and the next in line, 21 nearly kidnaps them, although they end up killing each other. Brock Samson, OSI agent and the Venture's bodyguard for the majority of the series. Brock is a tough one to place, you know, 
because of all the killing. <laughs> Granted, it's mostly self-defense, although not always, but it does have to be noted that he does like killing. But then you have stuff like Brock singing to the guild blackout agent when asked, or when he felt a lump on the underbite henchman and offering his sympathy. Brock does have a heart, a big one. It's just that he was trained to be the Swedish murder machine he is, and he, you know, enjoys his job. Brock genuinely loves and cares about the Ventures a lot, even referring to them as his family. He's more of a father figure to the boys than just a bodyguard, especially Hank. He even kept Rusty's illegal cloning facility secret from the OSI, despite sending in monthly reports on Dr. Venture. Brock is fiercely loyal and is always acting in the interest of the greater good, just like his mentor Hunter taught him. Captain Sunshine. Sunshine is a superhero powered by the sun. The death of Wonder Boy 3 at the hands of the monarch has left him clingy and paranoid. His relationship with his Wonder Boys have led the townspeople to believe he is a predator, although he actually isn't. Sunshine is technically a good guy, fighting bad guys, saving people and all that, but he isn't exactly that nice of a dude. He is currently in a legal battle with the former Wonder Boy 2, a deeply troubled man with an eating disorder and serious identity issues. Like other boy adventurers, his childhood was traumatizing and horrible, and now Sunshine's on his legal ass for petty things like his name, logo, and costume. Also, he kind of bashed Scorpio's head in, so there's that. Dr. Henry Killinger. Oh man, he was a hard one to place. So Killinger is first introduced as this sort of Mary Poppins figure. He comes across as friendly and even perfect, but characters like 21 and Orpheus find him immediately untrustworthy. He also exclusively helps villains. He likes to play matchmaker. He got the Monarch and Doctor Girlfriend back together and also tried to get Rusty and Myra back together. One of the worst ideas ever. In his next appearance, he tried to get Dr. Venture to become a supervillain, making him relive one of his most traumatic experiences and encouraging his bitter jealousy towards his brother. He also kicked out Orpheus. So not cool. Some may interpret this as an elaborate ruse to get Rusty to reflect on himself, which is a fair interpretation too, but it's still left ambiguous. He is eventually revealed to be one of the Investors, a group of otherworldly evil beings who grant wishes with a terrible price to pay. Killinger disagrees with his brothers, preferring to guide the mortals rather than manipulate them. He orchestrated the heist on Gargantua II in order to create a new Council of Thirteen, also killing his brothers in the process. So yeah, he's sort of good, but his guidance is towards villains. It's confusing when it comes to a morality chart like this, but I feel like this is a good spot for him. Watch and Ward. Watch and Ward are guild dispatch agents. They are incompetent and childish much of the time, but they also have a vast knowledge on guild law and history and rank higher up in the guild than one might expect. In the Gargantua 2 special, they disobey the Sovereign and save Dr. Girlfriend and Phineas Phage from being killed by him. Sergeant Hatred. Finally, for the Greys, we have Sergeant Hatred. So, Hatred was originally an OSI agent and was injected with a super soldier serum that caused his shameful attraction to young boys. At some point, he became a mole for the guild and eventually defected and became a supervillain. He then became the Venture's bodyguard, joining OSI once again. He was never that ruthless of a villain and was, in fact, really pretty harmless in that respect. As a bodyguard, he was also kind of useless, although he was enthusiastic and cared a lot about the Ventures. But that's not what you want to hear about, is it? The elephant in the room. It's kind of tricky because it was the serum that caused it and he is shown throughout the series taking medication to stop his affliction and is clearly ashamed of it. However, the first thing we ever learn about this guy is that he molested Hank and Dean at some point. He also says that he knows all about kidnapping young boys. How much can you say is the serum's fault and how much is his fault? Well, clearly everything he actually did to kids is his own fault, but he did go through great lengths to change, so that's why I put him right at the tail end of the gray area. And now, finally, the downright evil characters. Augustus St. Cloud. St. Cloud is a wealthy collector of pop culture memorabilia and the arch enemy of Billy Quizboy. This guy's entire life is dedicated to making Billy's life miserable. 
His acts are more petty than outright evil, like ruining Billy's vacation, trying to force him to eat pennies, or buying out conjectural technologies. He's also greedy, destroying historical film artifacts for his own benefit, or simply hoarding them for himself. His sidekick, P.Y., is more of a slave, with St. Cloud viewing him and Pete White as nothing more than collectible albinos. So even though he doesn't go around killing people, he just devotes so much of his life to making Billy and White suffer. All because Billy beat him on Quiz Boys when they were teenagers. Dr. Girlfriend. Sheila, aka Dr. Girlfriend, aka Dr. Mrs. The Monarch, aka a bunch of other names, is the wife of the monarch. Sheila was once an ordinary college student until her professor and boyfriend Hamilton Phantomos, aka Phantom Limb, seduced her into evil. She was a solo villain called Lady O'Pair, but when she bombed, she was made number two for several villains, including Phantom Limb, until she fell in love with the monarch and started number twoing for him. As a villain, Sheila is almost the exact opposite of her husband. While she does support him and his hatred for Dr. Venture, she is very by the books. In fact, her knowledge of Guild Law eventually earned her a spot on the new Council of Thirteen. She's incredibly loyal to the Monarch and the Guild, considering the Sovereign a father figure to her before his turn. On one mission, undercover as Charlene, she feels bad for Rusty after getting to know him more and gives him the antidote to the monarch's caterpillar serum. She comes to see Henchman 21 as a true friend. Overall, Sheila is the definition of lawful evil. Wide Whale Wide Whale, aka Chester Ong, is a villain and the father of Serena Ong and brother of Douglas Ong. He's more like a mafia boss than a traditional villain, running protection rackets, his fiends and family plan. After being mutated by the same experiment as his brother, their lives took completely different paths, with Dugon becoming a hero and Wide Whale a villain. His ventures are always more money motivated than someone like, say, the Monarch with a genuine grudge or Dr. Z who arches for fun. And sure, he will do anything he has to to get what he wants, but he also respects the guild rules and he's just not the kill and torture type. Myra Brandish. Myra was Rusty's old bodyguard, who eventually went insane. Dr. Venture told her she was the mother of Hank and Dean, and she wasn't. She became ridiculously clingy towards Rusty, demanding to be with him at all times. She eventually loses her job at the OSI, although we never see exactly why. What we do see is a crazed Myra being removed from the compound and her attempting to take Hank and Dean. She would spend the rest of her life coming back to kidnap Hank and Dean every few years. Since Brock almost says they don't remember her because they're clones, we have to assume she's killed them each of these times. Rusty also says she once burnt down part of the compound. Later, while being held in an asylum, she contacts Dean and gets him to come and see her. She performs a ritual where she attempts to give birth to him. I'll let your imagination work that one out. I put Myra relatively low on the evils list because she clearly has very little grasp on reality. Ms. Quim. She is the mother of Dr. Tara Quim and the ex-wife of Colonel Gentleman. She only appeared for a brief time, but she still managed to be one of the worst parents on the show. She took her young daughter to Jonas's key party, which is a party where everyone puts their keys in a bowl and then you pick out one and that's who you hook up with. Her only interaction with her daughter we see, she seems very annoyed by her very existence. She's also shown to be having an ongoing affair with Jonas. Anyone who hooks up with both Colonel Gentleman and Jonas Venture Sr., you know they gotta be bad. Also, according to Tara's bodyguard Ginny, she put her daughter through shock therapy at some point. Mike Soriyama. Mike went to university with Rusty, Pete White, Baron Underbite, and Brock. During his time in school, he was mostly just a nerdy little awkward guy, but he was completely obsessed with this girl, Leslie Cohen. His entire life revolved around her. He went on to be a successful robotics engineer, but continued to obsess over Leslie. It got so bad, she eventually took out a restraining order against him, and if someone built an army of robots with your likeness on them, you probably would too. So after his death, he programmed one of his robots to kidnap his former classmates from his funeral and planned on killing them for various petty offenses, such as underbite tricking him into smoking oregano, which he didn't know Mike was allergic to, White embarrassing him on his radio show, Rusty sleeping with Leslie, which he didn't even do, it was Brock, and Brock for beating them up the night of their last D&D game. 
Mike Soriyama is basically the personification of an R Nice Guys text. King Gorilla King Gorilla was in prison with the monarch along with a number of other villains. He's probably most remembered for helping the monarch escape prison despite threats from Phantom Limb, as well as making some kind of deal with the investors that resulted in them taking his heart and giving it to Monstroso. King Gorilla though is kind of... How can I put this in an advertiser-friendly way? Let's just say consent is not something he takes into consideration. Scott Hall, aka Henchman 1, aka Zero. He was originally the monarch's best henchman, but was left to die by 21 and 24. This caused him to resent henchmen and sidekicks. He tricked former Captain Sunshine Desmond into kidnapping a bunch of sidekicks and henchmen under the guise of throwing them a party. In reality, he forced them to fight each other, leaving them to suffer with their wounds or die. Then he joined the Revenge Society. During their heist on Gargantua 2, he tried to kill Brock as Venom vengeance for all the henchmen he's killed. Ironically enough, Brock ends up killing him for super reels this time. Monstroso. Monstroso is like this villain lawyer. His biggest role in the series was when he kidnapped Billy to perform his heart transplant. We know he's hooked up with the investors who are like extra bad. Brock tells Billy that what the investors and Monstroso have done is so bad he can't even go into detail about it. The Sovereign. The shape-shifting leader of the Guild of Calamitous Intent. A self-described nobody who wanted to be anybody other than himself. He most often took the form of David Bowie, but he was capable of becoming anyone or anything. At the beginning of the series, the Sovereign had the job of keeping order in the guild and was the head of the Council of Thirteen, a job he got by killing the former Sovereign as part of a deal he made with the investors. He seemed like a pretty good dude when we first saw him fighting back against Phantom Limb when he attacked the Monarch and Doctor Girlfriend's wedding, but this was really because Phantom Limb was trying to usurp him and become Sovereign himself. The details on his deal with the investors isn't exactly known, but we can assume that like Monstroso and King Gorilla, it would end with him dying. For this reason, he planned to destroy the Gargantua 2 space station in order to kill the investors and also murdered the members of the council after the OSI had identified them in order to protect himself. Only five of the members managed to survive. So despite being the leader of the guild, he really had no loyalty to anyone. He was just a selfish coward who never thought his evil roosters would come home to nest. Red Death Red Death is one of the most ruthless villains on the show. Most people like him because he loves his family, but don't be fooled. This guy is as evil as they come. He kills in a heartbeat. He was also one of the only survivors of the movie night massacre and helped plan the unsanctioned arching, although he didn't expect the bay doors to be opened. Red Death. There's a reason he has death in his name. Molotov. She is a mercenary and will do any job for a paycheck. She would kill you just as soon as she would protect you. She has no loyalties. She's even willing to kill members of her own organization, the Blackhearts. She was in love with Brock for a long time, and in her first appearance, she helped him out by telling him where the Ventures were, but only because her mission was taking her to the same place anyways. Even when she was in love with Brock, she hated his domestic side and was disgusted by how dedicated he was to his family. She did fill in as a bodyguard once, but again only because she was being paid to. In the season 4 finale, she is willing to kill the Ventures and everyone else at the prom. In season 5, she works for the OSI, purging them of double agents. But Molotov simply doesn't have any loyalties outside of what she is hired to do. She doesn't care about anyone enough to turn down any kind of assignment she gets. Her relationship with Brock didn't mean anything beyond a sexual attraction. Nancy and Drew Quim Nancy and Drew are Dr. Quim's daughters. They're child adventurers of the girl detective variety. They kind of, um, attempted to <coughs> rape Dean. And now I hadn't seen this episode since I was like 15 until I rewatched it for this video. And the way I remembered it was like, they didn't really realize what they were doing, but no, that's not what happened at all. They knew exactly what they were doing. They fully understood that Dean was too naive to know what they were doing, telling him they were going to solve the mystery of the Weradile. They intentionally send Hank into the jungle so that he wouldn't be around, ply Dean with alcohol, telling him it's to protect him from the Weradile. And unlike, say, King Gorilla or Sergeant Hatred or Nikki Victor, this is the only significant thing they've done in the entire series, so they don't have any good acts to even out the scale in any way. They also don't seem to see anything wrong with what they did. Vendetta. 
Yes, I am counting Vendetta as a different character than the Blue Morpho because he is. After Dr. Z reprogrammed him, he lost all of his memories and became a completely different character. Vendetta was a member of the Council of Thirteen, who his co-workers disliked because he was so cold and heartless, seeing as he's a cyborg and all. As a young up-and-coming villain, he was responsible for the movie Night Massacre on Gargantua 1, which claimed many lives, including Jonas Venture Sr. Kind of. We'll get to that. In short, Vendetta had no empathy or humanity left until years and years later when he began remembering his former life. Colonel Gentleman Colonel Horace Gentleman was a member of the original Team Venture who were super adventurers and of course helped raise Rusty. He also had a stepdaughter, Dr. Tara Quim. Now, in the current day, Gentleman is kind of just a crazy old man making lists and analyzing old tapes of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But make no mistake, this guy was horrible. He's a misogynist, he was abusive towards his wife and later his boyfriend Kiki. He's a racist, he was abusive towards Rusty and continues to be to this day. He named a sex act after Rusty Venture and one after Action Johnny in the 60s. Who names that after a child, especially one who's supposed to be like a nephew to you? And not just that, but the Rusty Venture is implied to be something really graphic and disgusting and if we believe Brock's definition, humiliating. So not only creepy, but cruel as well. Speaking of cruel, he and the action man humiliated Rusty on his 16th birthday in front of everyone by pantsing him and shooting his groin with Jonas's shrink ray. Mean-spirited pranks like this were a mainstay throughout Rusty's childhood. Also, another character who just loves killing when he gets the chance, Professor Impossible. Professor Richard Impossible is a super scientist with stretchy abilities thanks to an experiment gone wrong. He was emotionally abusive towards his wife Sally and forced her into isolation because of her condition. He also started a relationship with her when she was his student at the university. In his first appearance, he left Dr. Venture to die because he flirted with his wife. Impossible started out as technically on the good side, but eventually became a villain. He joined Phantom Limb's Revenge Society, which was pretty ineffectual, but probably the most evil thing he ever did was using Sally's cousin Cody to power Impossible Plaza. Let me explain this one. So when Richard and Sally's family were mutated, Cody's mutation was that he would burst into flames if he touched oxygen, and unlike the human torch, Cody could feel the pain of being on fire. When Sally lived there, he was kept asleep in an oxygen-free environment. But when she left, Richard kept him conscious and in pain using his fire as a power source. Keeping someone in agonizing pain 24-7 just to save money. Like, wow. Rusty Venture. Thaddeus Venture, aka Rusty, calls himself Dr. Venture, although he's not actually a doctor of anything. Rusty is selfish and completely self-centered. On the business side of things, Rusty puts money above ethics every time, whether that's using a dead orphan's heart to power his joy can, asking Brock to kill people so he can make more Venture Steins, or sacrificing the lives of college interns to create a ray shield for his brother. This is mainly because A, his dad was an abusive sociopath who taught his son that science and personal glory were more important than anything else, and B, because Rusty is such a failure, Venture Industries has been hemorrhaging money ever since he inherited it. Rusty is also rather nasty towards the women in his life. Again, he was raised by a group of men who treated women like objects, but again, an explanation, not an excuse. He told Myra Brandis she was the mother of Hank and Dean just to get free babysitting. He emotionally manipulated Sally Impossible so he could get inside Impossible Plaza. Of course, he did kind of save humanity that time. He, of course, had a relationship with Nikki Fichtel when she was 15 and impregnated her, although she did lie about her age. And to be clear, this isn't a pattern. Rusty is not some kind of predator of young girls, and in fact, most of the women he's attracted to are in their 40s or older. But still, as the adult, he should have been more diligent. Then we have Rusty's parenting, which again, a lot of it was learned behavior from his own upbringing. But, as we saw above, fellow former boy adventurer Action Johnny is able to recognize the abusive nature of their lifestyle. But of course, different people are affected by trauma differently. Rusty may be a better parent than his own father, but that still doesn't leave much to be desired. He still drags his kids around on adventures, neglects them, and takes advantage of them when convenient. Such as crashing at Dean's apartment during his summer internship. 
but Rusty does at least make an effort to be a better father than Jonas was. He is sympathetic to the fact that his kids don't want to follow in the super science venture tradition. Sure, he was pushing Dean towards science, but as he once confessed to what he didn't realize was Hank, that's because he thought Dean wanted that lifestyle. He also indulges Hank in his musical interests, giving him a vehicle to get to shows and appearing in his music video. He also took responsibility of Dermot once he learned he was his son, getting him into the OSI so that he could have a future. Despite all the terribleness, Rusty really does love his sons. Val and Ted, the other half of the Groovy Gang. Ted is the leader and self-serving psychopath who controls the others, mainly Sonny and Patty, through threats of violence. Val isn't so much in charge, but unlike the others, she actually seems to want to be there. She's mostly in her own little world. She hates men and believes most of them should be wiped out, quoting straight from The Scum Manifesto, the book authored by her namesake, Valerie Solanus. She's also known to grope Patty against her will. As I mentioned before, Ted withholds Sunny's medication from him and kidnapped Patty, keeping her locked in a box much of the time. The Action Man. The Action Man, aka Rodney, was a member of the original Teen Venture, a super soldier and Rusty surrogate uncle. Much like Colonel Gentleman, Rodney was awful and abusive towards Rusty during his childhood. Aside from the 16th birthday prank I described above, Rodney would play other so-called pranks on Rusty, like waking him up every morning with an empty gun to his head and pulling the trigger. Rodney was also pursuing Billy's mom, Rose, while he was married to his wife, Jeannie. The action man was incredibly violent, charging into situations with literal guns ablazing. He is responsible for the equally matched aggression act because he beat an unarmed newbie villain to death in front of Rusty. Yes, like Sergeant Hatred, he had some kind of super soldier serum injected into him, which would explain his overly violent nature, but that's no excuse for torturing Rusty for his own amusement. Tim Tom and Kevin. Tim Tom and Kevin were Dr. Girlfriend's henchmen, the murderous Moppets, when she was Lady Au Pair. They came back into the picture when she married the monarch. They're most notable as being the most hated characters in the history of the show. This is because they were horrible little men who constantly talked about stabbing people to death, including the monarch and Dr. Girlfriend, who they also used to perv on all the time. This may be because, at least according to Phantom Limb, the two are sleeper agents in his charge, ready to kill Sheila when ordered. They also liked bullying the other monarch henchmen, mainly 21 and 24. They stabbed 24 repeatedly after the cocoon was rebuilt, and he had to spend a long time in sickbay recovering. Later on, they killed 24 by detonating a bomb that was placed in Helper, a mystery 21 spent a long time trying to solve. Much to everyone's joy, 21 and the rest of the henchmen eventually killed them as retaliation for killing 24. Phantom Limb Phantom Lim is a seasoned villain who gave Dr. Girlfriend her start and is the grandson of guild founding member Phantomos. Notably, he has invisible arms and legs, which he can use to electrocute people to death by touching them. Originally a member of Jonas Ventures' Boys Brigade, he turned to villainy as an adult. He murdered his student assistant Stevie after discovering he was working for the OSI. Phantom Lim, in general, is pompous, sexist, and willing to kill just to prove a point. For example, when he ordered a hit on the Venture family just to show up the monarch. Phantom Lim loved to abuse his authority in the guild for his own personal gain. He framed the monarch for the murder of a police officer in order to get him sent to prison. Also, he could prevent Dr. Girlfriend from going back to him. He then lied to the other inmates, telling them not to help the monarch escape as ordered by the guild. The monarch did escape though, and Dr. Girlfriend did go back with him. So during their wedding, Phantom Lim waged an all-out war against the couple, kidnapping Sheila and attempting to overthrow the Sovereign. He was defeated, although to this day still claims to be the victor of the Battle of Cremation Creek. He was apprehended by the guild, escaped and kidnapped Red Mantle and Dragoon, forcing a kidnapped Billy Quizboy to sew them together. He again tried to overthrow the Sovereign and was again defeated. He also tried to activate the orb, thinking it was some kind of weapon, but it turned out to be a broken piece of junk. He then formed the Revenge Society. Well, a revenge society with other human beings rather than coffee cups and toasters. During the heist of Gargantua II, Phantom Lim had secretly made a deal with the Sovereign to destroy the space station, killing the investors and everyone else on board. He did seem to turn over a new leaf, however, being a member of the new council, although I believe his compliance is just because he finally received the power he felt he was always entitled to. The Monarch 
the main villain of the show and the one-sidedly sworn enemy of Dr. Venture. Even he doesn't seem to remember why exactly he hates Rusty so much. He just knows that he does, and this hatred is his main driving force, and has been pretty much his sole motivation his entire adult life. The only thing he's ever done that didn't revolve around arching Dr. Venture was winning the love of his life, Dr. Girlfriend. In college, Malcolm blew up the science building in hopes of killing Rusty, but only succeeded in blowing off Baron Underwrite's jaw. Besides that, he kills his henchmen without a second thought and is rather killy in general. He murdered Wonder Boy 3 in a drunken stupor and will kill civilians if they get in his way. In season 3, he was banned from arching Dr. Venture and murdered 8 of his new arches on the first day of being assigned to them. He was banned again in season 6 and went on a killing spree to take down Venture's other arches. Although most died accidentally, he still had planned on killing them and ordered 21 to kill several of them. The Monarch is a man who will do literally anything to get what he wants, and what he wants is to torture Dr. Venture. The Investors The Investors are three powerful entities who make Faustian deals with people for a terrible price. Not much is known about what they are or where they came from, but they are capable of seemingly anything. Teleportation, shapeshifting, and all kinds of other magic. They've caused a lot of death and chaos, and according to their brother, Dr. Henry Killinger, went, want to manipulate and rule over mortals. However, it seems that people do in fact know the price they are going to pay when making deals with them, so there is that. Jonas Venture Sr. Rusty's father, a world-renowned scientist and leader of the original team Venture. Jonas was able to present himself as this incredible hero and father, but in reality, he was a self-obsessed sociopath. But of course, the reason Jonas made it so high on this list is because of the sheer amount of lives he destroyed. Firstly, of course, his son Rusty. Jonas started taking Rusty along on his adventures when he was only three years old. These experiences traumatized his son throughout his entire life and left him the broken man he is today. Jonas was also emotionally abusive towards Rusty, such as his backhanded attempt at therapy or his constant criticism, even when he was as young as five. Jonas would throw his swingers parties while Rusty was in the house, not even making sure to stay out of the room Rusty was in, such as when he and Ms. Quim fell directly on top of their children while making out. There was also a rather traumatizing experience where Rusty was exposed to his father's penis. Yes, it was an accident, but this kind of carelessness also contributed greatly to the trauma instilled in his son. He also forced child stardom on Rusty, even using his brand to further gaslight the public and his son into believing he was this amazing, loving father. Jonas, of course, also ruined the life of Don Fitzcarraldo, aka the Blue Morpho. He blackmailed his so-called friend into doing his bidding, impregnated his wife, and brought him back from the dead as an obedient cyborg. Which of course means that he had to have retrieved Don's body from the plane crash. And as we all know, Jonas's biological son Malcolm, aka the Monarch, survived this crash, which means which means Jonas either saw him and left him there to die, or didn't even bother to check if he had survived. There's just so many horrible things Jonas Venture Sr. has done, leaving a group of orphans trapped under the Venture compound, encouraging his teammates to play cruel and unusual pranks on his son, and a litany of other offenses. Jonas didn't actually care about advances in science or saving people or any of it. The only thing he cared about was himself, and his seemingly selfless acts were all done either for his image or just the thrill of it. Jonas Venture Sr. He puts the ass in Jonas. And the most evil Venture Brothers character is Baron Werner Underbite. Kind of anticlimactic, I know. After all, wouldn't it have been so poetic and perfect to say that Jonas Sr. is really the most evil character in the Ventureverse? But he just isn't. It is interesting though, because these two represent two very different types of evil. Jonas is a very realistic type of evil, just a selfish, uncaring person with a lot of charisma and power. Underbite is more of a cartoony type of evil, but still evil nonetheless. Underbite has a massive body count, ruling over an entire country with an iron fist. 
Yes, it's true he inherited the throne and these rules were presumably already in place, but how can you not give most evil to a guy who executes literally every single one of his citizens? Not only is execution the punishment for every single crime, but every citizen is executed at the age of 37. Before that, they are forced to serve as Underbite's henchmen. He also killed all seven of his wives. Slavery is perfectly legal in Underland. In fact, Werner had his slave manservant since college. Despite manservant's years of faithful servitude, Underbite killed him on a whim to get into the Revenge Society, and it turned out Phantom Limb and Impossible just wanted him to sign a contract. Catclops also mentions that same-sex marriage is illegal in Underland, but child marriage is not. Underbite is someone who was given ultimate power and used it entirely to benefit himself. After losing that power, he was not all that successful at doing anything other than killing Manservant, but his relatively brief time as a dictator still earned him the title of most evil Venture Brothers character. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already and let me know in the comments if you would be interested in seeing more cartoon related content or more Venture Brothers related content.